events leading up to it. So let me give you a uh, some background history on my family and how they came to be here and the events that occurred after that. My maternal grandfather, Sadayano, was born in 1871 on the island of Shikoku, Japan. He married Kotoro Hondo in 1896. They had four children. They had two boys, Hayao and Isao, two girls, Meio and Itoko. Meio was my mother. He came to Hawaii in 1906 as a contract laborer. He made his way to San Francisco in 1908. He moved up to uh, Northern California towards Sacramento to a town named Yuba City where he was going to farm. He grew vegetables and sold them in neighboring Marysville. He sent money back home to take care of his family. In 1911, he sent for his wife. By 1918, his sons, Hayao and Isao, and one daughter, Mayo, joined them in Yuba City. The daughter, Itoko, remained in Japan. The grandparents returned to Japan in 1929. Hayao continued to run the farm. My father, Minoru Yoshikawa, was born in 1888. He, had, he was one of four siblings. He had older sister, older brother, and a younger sister. He got his passport in 1906 to come to the United States. He arrived in San Francisco in October 1906. He was 19 years old. I'm sorry, 17 years old. He got a job with Oliver Salt Company in San Mateo. He stayed in the Bay Area for uh, until 1911 during which time he learned how to read, write, and speak English. He also went north to Marysville, California, and got a job with t and Mercantile, a grocery store. He married Mayo Yano in nine, July 1918. They had five children, Francis, Paul, Lillian, Marvin, and Gordon. That's my, the last one. <laughs> they lived in a house adjoining the Yano farm in Yuba City. Um, and they purchased a small rooming house in Marysville across from TNM Mercantile. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. On December 8, Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared war on Japan. But also on December 8, a number of Japanese leaders, uh, community leaders and business leaders, were taken into custody by the FBI. My uncle Isao, who was working as a translator for the Japan Foreign Trade Bureau in Houston, Texas, was picked up on the morning of December 8th. And he was taken to Fort Sam Houston and then to Santa Fe Detention Station, which was the Department of Justice facility. In Yuba City on 
December 24th, my parents had to get an identification card from the Yuba County Defense Council. On this card was a photograph, signature, fingerprint, and physical description, height, weight, color, hair, eyes, and the address. On February 5th, 1942, they were required to get a certificate of identification from the Department of Justice. There was, this was an alien registration card. This looked more like a passport. It had blank pages in between. But it too had picture, a photograph, a signature, fingerprint, and physical description. But this one had to be carried at all times and shown to the police if they were asked. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which gave the Secretary of War and the military the authority to designate military zones from which they can exclude any and all persons to protect from espionage and sabotage. Um, on March 2nd, 1942, General John DeWitt, who was in charge of the Western Defense Command, designated the Western States as Zones 1 and 2. So from Washington, Oregon, California, and Southern Arizona, the Western half was considered Zone 1, and the rest of the state was Zone 2. On March 6, 1942, the FBI came and picked up my father at the TNM Mercantile. They took him to the Marysville City Jail and to San Francisco, and that's all we knew. We couldn't get any more information. So from that point, we had no idea where he was and had no contact with him. On, uh, there was a public law 503 sign or, uh, passed by Congress, which uh, set penalties of up to $5,000 and up to a year imprisonment for disobeying the exclusion order. There was also a curfew set from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. and travel restrictions. Civilian exclusion order, these are orders for you to leave the area. Order number 69 came in, which covered Military Zone 1, which was Yuba City. In this case, we had Yuba City, a river, and then Marysville. And Marysville was Zone 2, so it wasn't affected by the uh, early leaving. So when uh, the exclusion order came in, there was a short period where you could voluntarily leave Zone 1 and move inland. Well, at that time, uh, from Yuba City, we are just going across the river, and uh, we moved from the farmhouse to the uh, rooming house that we had in Marysville. My uncle did the same thing, except he had to leave his farm. And he went to Marysville, where he also had a produce business. I gotta catch up.
At the end of March, the uh, voluntary movement out of Zone 1 was then prohibited, so they couldn't get out if they wanted to. Exclusion order number 101 came for Marysville. It said that the people in Marysville then would be leaving in early July. When the exclusion order came out on the order, it said that a family member had to go to uh, the control area to register their family. <coughs> so since my father wasn't there, my sister went down and got a family registration number, which was 38599. So since she went down there, her name was 38599-A. My mother was dash B. Uh, my sister and on down, down to me was dash F. And they even gave my father a dash G even though he wasn't even there. Uh, we sold what we could, couldn't sell the rooming house. I think we sold the car. We packed up uh, whatever we had, crated up, and had it stored in a government uh, warehouse. Some places, like Bainbridge Island in Washington on the Puget Sound, were only given a week to, from the time they were notified to leave. Same thing happened in the LA area with uh, Terminal Island. Yuba City people, uh, when the exclusion order came, uh, were sent to Merced, California. Merced was one of 17 assembly centers there were two centers in Arizona, one in Washington, one in Oregon, and all the rest were in California. They were in cities such as Puyallup, Washington, Portland, Oregon, Mayer and Parker Dam, Arizona. In California, it was Fresno, Owens Valley, Marysville, Merced, Pinedale, Pomona, Sacramento, Salina, Santa Anita, Stockton, Tanforan, Tulare, and Turlock. These are the listings of it and where some of the people went. From the assembly centers, they would then go to a permanent camp. But they had, um, Portland had a mess hall, uh, it would show a mess hall. This is the dining facility at one of the assembly centers. At Santa Anita, they would start out with the horse stalls when the first people started coming in. And even though they tried to clean it up, the smell was still there. And they finally built some barracks. This is uh, the people coming into Santa Anita with armed guards. And then they started building barracks within the Santa Anita uh, inside area, which we did next one. So you see the buildings in the back, but you also see barracks. That's where the Japanese were held for a period. My late wife was living in the Los Angeles area. She ended up in Santa Anita. And from Santa Anita, she was sent to a permanent camp in 
Roller, Arkansas. We have a map that shows uh, the permanent camps and triangles and then the assembly centers and dots, but it's sort of hard to see from a distance. But from the, aside from the 17 assembly centers, they had 10 permanent camps. The camps in California were Tule Lake, where I was, Manzanar. In Arizona, it was Holston and Gila River. In uh, Arkansas, it was Rower and Jerome. In Utah was Topaz, in Wyoming, Heart Mountain, in Idaho, Minidoka, in Colorado, Granada, also known as Amachi. So this shows, shows the uh, dates that the camps first opened and what the peak population was. Some of them uh, you see like 18, over 18,000 people, 17,000 people on peak uh, population. And the departure dates are mostly in 1945, although you have had one that didn't close until March of 1946. set up to leave uh, Murraysville. We took a train up to uh, Tootley Lake in the uh, California-Oregon border. And uh, uh, we left on <coughs> July 12th from Marysville to go up there. From the train, we were in uh, army trucks to go to our barracks. And as we were approaching our block, there were a number of men running behind to welcome us. And we were quite surprised and pleased to see my father among the men who were coming. And we hadn't seen or heard from him in four months. We found out that after he was taken to San Francisco, he ended up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And during his stay there in, in May, he had a hearing from the Enemy Alien Hearing Board. So the name doesn't sound good. But at the hearing, was two board members, a U.S. assistant U.S. attorney, a reporter, and a translator, even though a translator wasn't needed. But at that point, they said that he was apprehended under emergency authority granted by the U.S. attorney in San Francisco as potentially dangerous to the public peace and safety of the United States. So it doesn't get any broader. And this is the same wordings that was used when my uncle 
he saw all was picked up in Houston, Texas. This is a group photo. It says Lordsburg, but I think it was really Santa Fe. And my father is second from the left on the next to the top row. But it's funny when I was showing some of these pictures to uh, a group that I golfed with, I found out that two of the golfers had their parents, had their fathers at Santa Fe also. At the enemy alien hearing, I don't think it was really to find out why he was there, but what to do next because he had already been there for a couple of months. So they said that there was a confidential source that said that he had I guess he had some some leanings toward the Japanese government. They said that he belonged, or he was active in the Japanese Association, and apparently he had been uh, director for a year. He had been treasurer of the Japanese language school for a year, and the fact that his daughter went to Japan in July of 1941 when when things between Japan and the United States weren't too good, they thought that was something that either he or someone had instigated and said that she was there until uh, October. Well, they didn't say that during her stay, which would have probably been three weeks visiting her grandparents, turned into a longer stay because Japan discontinued. They stopped all ships going back to the U.S. So she was sort of stranded there. So she stayed uh, with her relatives for a while, but things were getting rather strained there because uh, uh, I guess they people look at her as an American. And she's probably taking up a lot of the resources that they desperately need. So she went to Yokohama to see if she could find another ship back. And she was lucky enough to get the last ship back in October. So she left Japan October 15th, arrived in San Francisco October 30th. From the uh, hearing, they said that they would parole my father. So uh, apparently that's what had happened. They were paroling him with restrictions, which means he went from one facility to another one. So he ended up in Tule Lake. We also have the general terrain around Tule Lake and Topaz. A uh, lot of brushes, no trees. And when the dust gets rained on, then you have mud. And this is a painting of barbed wire fence that goes around the perimeter with guard towers at intervals. And they also had areas where they would try to stop people who were getting too close to the fence. And there had been an instance where one or two people were shot. In Tule Lake, uh, the barracks were about 20 by 100 feet, and this was broken up in about six units. 
our family of seven had two of the units. So we had an uh, area of maybe 20 feet by 30, 35 feet. We had army cots. We had mattresses stuffed with straw. We had a pond belly coal burning stove for the winter and one light bulb. So uh, as people were there for longer periods, they would get scrap wood and they would start building uh, furniture and whatever else to make it more livable. On the barracks, there was no running water, no indoor toilet, no stove for cooking, no icebox. All these things you had to go outside to do. We had about 15 barracks per block. The mess halls were communal like you saw in the one in the assembly center. You had a laundry room, men and women's latrine, and men and women's showers. These provided no privacy. I think later on they started building stalls for women's showers, but uh, the men had nothing in between. Uh, the latrines were like army, so you had just one right after another. So in this case, whether it's day or night, hot or cold, wet or dry, dusty or not, you had to go outside your barracks to go to the mess hall. You had to go outside of your barracks to go to the latrine. You had to go outside of your barracks to go take a shower. There was some work available and they were paying $12, $16, and $19 a month. The $12 was for unskilled labor, $19 was for professionals. That was doctors and nurses and, and teachers. My father was on the Fire Prevention Bureau, but it's a block fire department. And well, that's hard to see, but he's the guy who looks like a long time, but that's him. Before long, <coughs> Truly Lake became a segregation camp. There were people who wanted to return to Japan. So they started coming into Thule Lake and people who wanted to remain in the U.S. were transferred elsewhere. And our family, um, our family was transferred to Topaz, Utah. This is showing the uh, barracks set up at Topaz. Because in Topaz, it didn't look like you had much vegetation at all. Uh, some of the other camps had trees and water enough that you can start doing gardens. And this is a general layout of the camp itself. And each block has like 15 barracks in it. And that was the whole layout. And this was our family in Topaz. My mother, father, and my brother. So he left in 1944. And this is a group photo of our block in Topaz. And on this one it shows. <laughs> Nice to have a 
it was nice to have a photo of the entire block. Uh, I was asked a question about uh, uh, how did I end up here. And it sort of started out in 1943. Uh, if you could, you could leave the camp and go east if you had either a school to go to, a job to go to, a relative to go to, or you get sponsored by someone. But my sister was the first one out in 1943. She got a job here in Cincinnati with the YWCA. So she got settled in and my other sister came out and so they, she left the uh, YW, well, she was boarding at the YW and they got an apartment in Norwood. So then my brother came out uh, the one brother went to Detroit and he worked and then he went in the army. My other brother came out and went to school at Norwood so they had to get another, uh, I guess, larger apartment. So when my parents and I came out in 1945, they had to start looking for a home to rent. Well, they did so. They found a home in Hyde Park to rent through connections with the YW. And before we moved in, the minister at Presbyterian Church in Hyde Park canvassed the neighborhood that we were going to be in to see if there was any objections in having a Japanese family move in. And apparently there wasn't or they didn't say, say anything. So we were able to move in. My next door neighbor was a boy about my age. He had an uncle that was killed in the Pacific. So when we went to the same school, he would walk on the other side of the street. But eventually we got to be friends and, and things changed. There were 92,000 people that went to assembly centers. 2,800 of us went directly to a permanent camp. All this mass evacuation took place in eight months. So from time EO 9066 came up, eight months later, all the Japanese were gone from the West Coast, except for the two camps in California. Um, I think that's it. Oh, uh, there were some people who disobeyed the exclusion order. Uh, the three were involved in cases against the government. And the man on the left is Gordon Hirabayashi. He was arrested for breaking curfew and failing to register at a control center. Men Yasui was a liar. He challenged the curfew as racial discrimination. The man on the right is Fred Korematsu and he ignored the evacuation orders. They were all in prison. They went as far as the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the ruling. They said there was too much military necessity and that found out that that wasn't the case. Uh, I guess as an uh, afternoon, there was a movement for redress to get an apology and uh, monetary redress for the evacuation. And this was called the Commission on Wartime Internment and Relocation of Civilians. 
And one day, uh, they held a number of uh, hearings throughout the United States, and they got a lot of testimonies. And they found out that it really wasn't uh, a military necessity. And I'm not going to find the ruling. Well, anyway, they they overturned it later on. So um, the redress efforts went through, ended up with Ronald Reagan signing a Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which gave a written apology and a monetary award of $20,000 to all survivors. And in 1976, Gerald Ford rescinded Executive Order 9066. And that's what I have. <laughs> Just ask you come up for the mics. There's one on each side. I have two questions. One, was there any educational um, anything made, uh, made available for education of the children in the camp? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, there were schools. Uh, usually they brought in uh, teachers from outside, uh, Caucasian teachers, but then they would start getting help from uh, some of the internees who were teachers. So they did try to continue education. Good. What, my other question is, was there any kind of organized resistance against moving into these camps? There really wasn't that much. There was a number of uh, people who opposed it, but there was not an a overabundance of it, mainly because of the age group, I think. Because the younger people were either late teens or early 20s, so they really didn't have much influence. The parents were, like my father was in his 50s, so they, they don't really have that much voice, even though he had been, uh, he was in uh, Marysville for 30 years, but still uh, didn't give him enough uh, power to do anything. Thank you. I'd like to know the location of that topaz in Utah. Is that a desert area? It is a desert area. Call that east or west or north or south? Oh, yeah, that is desert to Utah. Yeah, that is very desert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little bit worse than Owens Valley. Well, some of the, the pictures shown earlier showed uh, sagebrush and not too much of anything else there. One more question. When when you were uh, removed, or when they were removed, removed from California, oh, <laughs> so I can be talking to you. When when they were removed, the Japanese were removed from California. Were the uh, the pro their properties or anything were were they able to sell any of those properties? Usually, you didn't have enough time. <laughs> So most people lost whatever they had. Uh, if you own property or businesses, uh, you were taken away so you couldn't keep up the payments. So you would lose by default. There were some instances where neighbors went as far as harvesting their crop, selling their product, and putting the money in the bank for them when they returned. But that's usually more of an exception than the rule. Because you had people come in and they, 
they knew that you had to sell things uh, dirt cheap or not sell it at all. And there were some families that had uh, uh, maybe some uh, kimono or something from Japan that they treasured, but they would rather burn it than leave it behind. Something like Bad Day at Black Rock with Spencer Tracy. <laughs> oh, maybe so. Thank you. Well, that was one of my questions about property. You were never reimbursed or you didn't get to sell things. You mentioned that you got to put belongings into a government warehouse. Yes. Uh, on uh, belongings, some people would uh, put their belongings, pack up their belongings, and take it to the church that they belong to, or take it to friends. Uh, but it didn't always work out, because sometimes uh, if you put it in another location, it could have gotten vandalized over the three years or so. So that was sort of a toss up too. Okay. And how old were you when you moved to Cincinnati? Uh, I was 10 when I left uh, camp. So I came here when I was just finishing up fifth grade. So I did like 20 days in fifth grade and then moved on. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes. How many, what percentage of all of those people were citizens? Um, it was about 60% were citizens. Uh, when you see the, the exclusion order, it says, aliens and non-aliens. It doesn't say aliens and citizens. So they, they were very careful in what they were saying. But uh, about 60% were U.S. citizens. I, I didn't realize that it was just eight months that they just rounded up in eight months that short of time. That's a short amount of time. Yeah, that went a food for thought. In the one camp, you said that they were released in 1946 and not 1945. Why, why was that? I can't hear. You said that in the one camp, they were released in 1946 and not 1945. Why? Why was that? Uh, why, why they left at different times? So there was one camp. Um, all of the camps left in 1945, the year the war ended, but the camp at the very bottom, uh, they were not all released until 1946. She wants to know why they were released after the war. Uh, I'm not quite sure. The 1946 is the camp that I was in. We left in May of 1945, but they didn't close the camp until 1946. And I think part of that is trying to get all the internees out somewhere, maybe they didn't all have somewhere to go. So maybe they lost family that they couldn't really connect with. So I'm not sure why the various camps had different dates. What made you and your family want to go to Cincinnati? Uh, it all started out with my sister coming to work for YWCA in Cincinnati, and that sort of brought the rest of our family here. It's like my uh, late wife was in Arkansas. Her family came out to Cincinnati because uh, her uncle's, let's see what you her uncle's sister was here in Cincinnati. Um, her husband was a professor at the University of Cincinnati in 1931. So that sort of brought that family here. Some of the other reasons are they sort of scattered out some cities where uh, the people would be more acceptable. I think when some of the people started coming out of camp. They didn't have uh, a preparation for the community. 
and all of a sudden all the Japanese were coming in and they didn't like it. So through, like Cincinnati had a large uh, network of church people, business people, community leaders, uh, a whole lot of them that helped them come through and uh, made the transition a lot easier. What kind of food did you eat in the camp? Like, what if you remember what you used to eat in the camp as a child, and if you played any sports or games? Uh, yeah, it's funny. I ask people about what what foods do they remember, and they don't remember a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> they, like my wife, would remember. You know, you had to eat the jello first because it was going to melt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the food, when when first went into camps, the quality of food was very bad. Uh, there was a lot of pilfering going on, and the quality of food coming in was bad, so they couldn't make it any better. But then, uh, as it went along, the food quality got better. The people at different camps started growing food. So then they would have enough that they could send to some of the other camps. So once that happened, then uh, uh, things got much better. But as children, children can survive almost anything. And you, you, I guess just make up games or you have simple games. and. Uh, like hunting scorpions and fun <laughs> <laughs> things like that. <laughs> or playing in a coal pile. They would have built forts in the coal pile. So these these are kid stuff that you know they'll survive no matter what. Why do you know why your relatives came to the United States? Uh, I think I think it was because of the economic nature at that time. Uh, the my grandfather and my father were the second sons in the family and the eldest son is the one that usually gets uh, inherits the, the property and, and whatever else that goes with it so they didn't see much of a future so they felt that they would have a better opportunity by going somewhere else, and the United States was one of them. Do you um, remember any of the young men, I believe, volunteered for the, was it the 442nd uh, Infantry? We used to have a number of the men in Cincinnati. Uh, I was really too young to really know them. Uh, so, um, I guess we really didn't, uh, talk to that many that were here. Uh, early on, I think there were probably a uh, dozen or more here. Uh, we also had uh, one person, I think that was a commander uh, of 442nd unit, and he was here for a while. And he was a Caucasian officer. What was the primary language spoken at these uh, camps? Uh, what was the primary language spoken at these camps? Was it uh, English or Japanese? The older people were speaking Japanese and the younger were speaking English. And, uh, were like the uh, school classes, were those taught in English or Japanese or uh, like a mixture of well, both? Well, you're, you're talking about 60% of them that were American citizens. So they're the young, younger ones who are anywhere from my age to uh, mid-20s or more. So basically, it's all English. 
and the parents, of course, would uh, talk in Japanese. Any other questions out there? All right, well, thank you, Gordon, again, for coming and sharing your story.